Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Nick Anthony. Nick is the CEO of Pymeos, which is an electrical contract engineering company here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Nick, welcome to the pod. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. So we've known each other apparently five years now, but only two that we knew about are one. Uh, it's good to good to hang out with you finally on here. I'm Likewise, and I appreciate the Japanese whiskey. Yeah, it's it's fun drinking Japanese whiskey. Uh, Suntory Toki, good good low key Japanese whiskey for people listening. Suntory, if you pay us, we'll be very happy. <laughs> so, yeah. So how did you get into the contract engineering game? The short story is I worked in corporate engineering for five years and I saw what we were paying embedded consultants coming into the company. I won't say the company's name. Um, and I wanted to make the money that the consultants were making. So I went out into embedded consultant and this was right before the buzzword IoT became popular. It was embedded systems engineering at the time, but like right when I started, it was like IoT, blah, 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 blah. So that was all of the marketing language I started to use. So we evolved into a, an, uh, an IoT product development company. So started off doing just contract engineering. You pay us to do X, we design Y, hand it off. Uh, now we do low volume, manufacturing and well, we, we manage the design from concept to prototyping through low volume manufacturing. So we own the customer relationship through production. Oh, cool. So what kind of volumes do you guys typically hit when you say production? Like what's, what's an average run? What's like high run? The lower end is a thousand units a year. The higher end is 10,000 a year. Nice. Uh, beyond then, beyond that point, we subcontract out. But but you're still doing ten thousand in house. It's a it's a mix of um, so under the same roof we have uh, we work with a company TriPro Technologies that does um, tooling for plastic injection molding, and they run production plastics for a couple of joint customers. So. We do some of the manufacturing in-house, like the, the printed circuit board fabrication still gets outsourced because we're not gonna run an SMT line at our facility in New Brighton, uh, but we will do the final box build assembly, QA and fulfillment. Cool, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, no, it was a cool facility. I was there the other day, um, really enjoyed meeting Will and also seeing what you had. Tripo's got some really cool machines. You guys have some really interesting tech set up in there too. Thank you. So, that nah, you're welcome. Thank you for showing me around. I, I had a great time. So, yeah, that's, uh, and I mean, those are super respectable quantities. I mean, we only really go up to like maybe the 10 unit quantity. <laughs> it's uh, much lower, but then we hit complex systems. So, create crazy stuff, but lower quantity. Yeah, a lot of the stuff we do, it's like true embedded. So not super intelligent, high processing, just like we, you pack as much intelligence at the edge you can with super low power, like battery driven, 3.7 volt rechargeable stuff. That's awesome. What are some of the things you're working on? We've gotten, a, recently we've gotten a lot of work that's kind of um, emergent. I think is, I don't know, is that the right word? What, what does it mean? Like, it's an emergency, like, whatever the, that tense of the verb is, like, it's an emergency at the moment kind of thing. Like a, Oh, uh, like, uh, like triage, like um, bleeding yeah. neck type work. Yeah, 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 exactly. Bleeding yeah. neck is the, is the... We need it solved in a month, can you Exactly. <laughs> We've gotten a lot of that stuff as a result of COVID because it's, it's, production's going to stop here, so fix this immediate problem so we can continue production kind of thing. So we've actually gotten, we've broadened our customer base and diversified um, industries as a result of onboarding customers who have those like immediate needs because supply chain shit the bed. Yeah, it makes sense. I can say that right, like a, that, that, that's like. You can say shit the bed, <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
swearing's fine. Um, can I say fuck? You can say fuck. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. You can say shit. You can say fuck. Um, it's it's pretty pretty low key in that way. So what this podcast tries to do is be like um, just low key conversation with people doing interesting things in technology research and entrepreneurship. So you can say fuck. You can say shit. Uh, you can talk about fucked up shit. <laughs> and, uh, cool. You know, it's, it's, I think what makes it interesting is just trying to hear you know the crazy shit people have had to deal with. Which is like, I mean, I guess that's a good question to go into is what's some of the craziest shit you've had to do in sort of a short amount of time? So like an emergency, maybe you didn't think you were going to be able to extinguish and, and how you fixed it. <laughs> so uh, the probably the most stressful one was a I'll call it a consumer product, but it, it, it's not sold into the consumer market, but, um, and I'll, I'll use generic language to not, you know, yeah, I get whatever, it. whatever. Um, you've got customers to be mad. <laughs> as well. yeah. So, so we had, a, I had a, a contract engineering group I was working with that, um, totally dropped the ball on, um, what they were supposed to deliver. I was like, yeah, Hey, we have this, like wireless technology that'll do X, Y, Z. And it's like, all right, well, we'll just use that for this project because it meets, supposedly meets all the requirements. And the long story short is they actually didn't have a complete product. And I was like, oh God. it was like, it was like totally uh, prototype skunk works. Like we needed, we needed a wireless system that communicated uh, many to one. Um, and the requirement was 120 to one. So you mean there's 120 nodes talking to one thing? Correct. Interesting. And then these guys, like, yeah, we got, you know, <laughs> we can communicate 50 to one as of today. And oh, we Jesus. Can, and, and, but, it, but the system can scale up to 100. So like, all right, well, that, that, that'll meet the requirement. So, I mean, this was, this was uh, we developed this for um, close to 12 full months. And this was 2019 going into 2020. So this was like right before COVID hit. And... <laughs> We were supposed to have 120 units out for pilot in March of 2020, and and you'd only test up to 50. I thought I thought they had tested up to 50. They, oh, had, they had only tested one to one. Are you fucking serious? So in March, when I have a I have a PO out to these guys for 250 units because we the the way that the system was set up, we needed. Um, it was the same transceiver on both ends, so we needed double what we were gonna. We had a. We had to outfit. I'm picturing like a Zigbee, but I'm sure you it was more sub sub gigahertz. Okay. Um, 950 megahertz uh, wireless um, star network. Oh, cool. And uh, with the one being the center of the star. Correct. Oh, that makes sense. And up to th these guys were telling me mile range, is what is what. They, Sounds like that wasn't accurate even at one to one. Uh, so. <laughs> So like, I, I and and I can I can go into as many like rabbit hole stories as we want. No, this is what I love. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like, I'll yeah I'll, I'll tell the story. We can either like at any point in the story we can kind of like fraction off into into rabbit holes through this. So um, I, I pay these guys a lot of money to deliver. Um, the, the purchase order was for like 250 units. They deliver us like, I don't know, 50, 50 units of things. And once I start testing them, like we can't, we can't even um, get one to one talking like beyond a hundred yards. Oh Jesus! Of range. And this this has to this, like the requirement was like three times that. So like I can't even get one talking. It's like. So they said a mile, even though you needed 300 yards. They were like, yeah, we way overshot it. We can do this. Well, so they, they knew the requirement was for, um, it, it was for performance athletics. And this, this had to be like, it was a wearable on a, on a person. And they achieved, they claimed they achieved mile uh, range by um, putting an external antenna on a fucking drone and flying a drone in the sky that had line of sight to some receiver like interesting um 
not worn on a human being, not enclosed in a... In I mean, a, that seems acceptable if it works. I don't know. I don't know what your use case is, so I can't say for sure or not, but... There's no... Yeah. There's no external antenna. It's war- it has to be like worn. Oh, like, so it isn't acceptable. No, no, not acceptable in any way, shape, or form. And like, yeah. like these were the, the these were the requirements like from yeah. day one. So, um, so that's going into March 2020, and I'm, I have like, I've spent all of the budget, and I'm supposed to deliver 150 of these things, and we got nothing. So I'm so, <laughs> so I'm out of money. I got 50 of something that doesn't work and um covid hits like thank god covid hit because the the season was canceled so they didn't they didn't even have a sales cycle to go through so like the the global pandemic actually like helped us in in some respects yeah so, that was helpful to us in some respects as well <laughs> but um now so like budget's gone and we still got to deliver this shit yep um so I got like another twelve months to like. So I have to finance the entire thing. Oh geez. And um, was there money on the other side of it? Like if you could deliver, was there a bunch more cash to be had, or were you not just a out bu- of pocket? Not a bunch more, but it went into a manufacturing cycle. So at that, like once we got through the design, then they had to buy. Like we were in the, we were producing units. You could at least get it back over some period of time. Yeah. Right? So it was either it was either. We collect no money. So it was reputational at this point. Completely like you, you reputational. Were just in it to not look like an asshole. Completely. Like yeah. that, that is the, that was the only motivating factor. Um, cause I was like money was zero. So I had to, yeah, been there. So we had, uh, we had a, a EIDL loan from COVID. Like we just took out. Yeah, we did that too. Money. Um, so, and I needed, I needed another engineer to a specialized engineer for, for like a very specific task in um, the application firmware and so we spec'd out this entirely different system like separate, <laughs> separate from what these assholes gave us and um, because COVID had just hit um, my VP of sales had a connection at a semiconductor company and um, this semiconductor company was uh, Silicon Labs. Um, they all of their in-person conference got moved to virtual at the last second. They like lost a bunch of sponsorship. So you're in this virtual event. Um, you got offered to be a sponsor at the last minute because the people pulled out due to COVID. So it's like my company next to like big names of that that like sponsored the event, and they probably paid like way more. Yeah. <laughs> Then, then whatever the fuck we paid. And um, so we got like a dedicated Slack room. We got to interview potential employees. And I, we were in the market to hire somebody. And I, I, was, I was searching for the best engineer I could find in this field. So you were purely there in a recruiting capacity? Purely recruiting. That's interesting. That's it. Did you have a good uh, result from that? Like I feel like our virtual events, we were doing, we did four. Um, for similar dollar amounts, I'll say, but you know, that's, that's what it is. And, um, we were there in a sales capacity and the results were dismal. <laughs> like it, not a whole lot of people were trying to, uh, to buy or show up at those things. Unfortunately, my experience was different and it resulted in like a complete unicorn. That's, that's awesome. I am like it was complete luck. Um, he's like the he's a stellar human being and is the most impactful single person I think I could have ever envisioned like stumbling across. And he's he's based out of Argentina. Cool. And like the most high quality, high impact uh, work I've ever seen. Ever. ever like ever like ever. compared to and I've worked with a decent amount of engineers here in the states and like it doesn't even come close lazy Americans <laughs> overpaid <laughs> Fat pigs. overpaid McDonald's loving <laughs> gun toting <laughs> 
<laughs> so because of him, nine months later, we were able to output product. That's awesome. That's, that's really cool. And it, it passed the 150 to 1 test. One, our, our, the requirement was 120 and we can get 124. Oh, well then you're good. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Or 128. Yeah, well, yeah. you're even more awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we, we had an issue sort of like that, but a little bit different. Um, we had a kinematics, kinematics module on a robotic system um, that we were working on where we were using sensors on a person to figure out the uh, angles of the different joints on their arm, so to be able to model like where their arm is at. And we paid a person um, a bunch of money to be able to do that. So you've got like XYZ roll pitch yaw, XYZ roll pitch yaw, and you have to figure out from those and, and like a known position of the system, you know, where this person's arm is at. And the engineer we hired showed it to us in MATLAB and it all worked and we're like, great, awesome. And partly through the project, the engineers that were working for me we're saying, hey, you should take a look at this. And I thought I was too important to look at it. And I was like, I got all this <laughs> stuff going on. I can't do that. And finally, I'm just like, all right, fuck it. So I put on my you know, engineer's hat and I, I read the Python code, which it was supposed to be C and the guy wrote it in Python, which is already very bad. And we uh, realized that, or I realized that it um, was not a kinematics library. It was a radian to degree converter and the only real math it did was a modulus around uh, 360 degrees. So if you fed it 720, it would feed you back. Yeah, and so it was a total, the guy scammed us, right? He, he said he was gonna do a thing and he did not. And he delivered like 100 lines of code that did what I just described. And I was livid. <laughs> and I think we only had four months left to deliver a completed system that relied on this library to work. Um, so I spent all of our profits on hiring people to build this library. And I kind of went one after the other, after the other, I went through six engineers and, um, that's intense. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was sweating. I didn't sleep more than four hours a night for a month. And, um, Finally, uh, the college kid was able to crack it. It was a master's student at Carnegie Mellon that I got at a career fair in person. This would have been 2017. And um, <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing. I mean, well, I probably shouldn't say. But he, he did a really good job on that. And so um, that guy and I have worked together on multiple projects since then. Yeah, yeah. You find <clears throat> You find that solid relationship but like you you want to carry that through to other successes yeah no if someone does right by you you yeah. want to do right by them and also you you want to keep you know feeding the golden goose as it were <laughs> yeah <laughs> totally true so how did you get involved with innovation works that's where we met through for people listening is it well, I think so. no, sort of, in a roundabout sort of way. No, because we got introduced by the one dude Liam. that we mutually... Liam. Well, no, the first one... Yeah, but that was through IW. Was it? I think so. The first yeah. guy we both knew through IW. He who should not be named. That wasn't through IW for me. For me, that was through IW. Him okay. and I were in okay. that program that you consulted um, But yeah, on. no, we got, we got reconnected through yeah. Liam. Yeah, Liam's a good dude. He's yeah. been on the podcast. Liam, oh, has he? Yeah, yeah, and he's gonna I'll, come on again. I'll have to listen to his. Did he say anything um, interesting or offensive? I uh, I don't think he was offensive. I mean, Liam's definitely he's de he's never weird. offensive. Like that's why that's why I'm, I'm interested in getting like a soundbite. Yeah, now he he's a weird person. I mean, he's got a <laughs> lot of eclectic knowledge of philosophy and 
just yeah. interesting academic stuff that I know nothing about. I mean, he's he's definitely learned and, and well-read, to say the least. He's one of my favorite people. Yeah, he's not, not an idiot, as they say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I like that guy as well. Yeah, he's he's actually like... I think he's got like a really good heart, but he tries to hide it. So... I think that's an accurate description. Yeah. Like yeah, he, yeah. He wants you to think he's Machiavellian, but he's yeah. actually a really nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that's spot on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I like him too. So what are some of the other interesting things you've worked on? Um, I, I don't know what you can and can't talk about, so obviously in the scope of the former... I think one of the one of the early cool things that we worked on was a Leo satellite constellation. Leo, lower Earth orbit satellite. Interesting. Okay. So there's a bunch of, I think SpaceX is probably the most. Um, the Starlink things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the the put thousands of these things up in the. Orbit. And I wonder if they ever crash into each other. So the system that we did yeah. for it wasn't for Starlink; it was for another company. Um, the system we did was the main um, oscillator that communicated. It it performed two functions. One was it got upscaled to shoot the um, KAKU band down to the Earth for the uh, high speed internet connection. But it also was used for all of the satellites to communicate amongst one another to avoid collision. Okay, I'm a little confused. So this this is interesting. So the KU band, first of all, is is what? Some uh, high frequency. Uh, Approximately can, how many? Are you, can you Google on this thing or like? I, I don't want to because yeah. I, I feel like it takes you out of the conversation. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's some frequency. Band high frequency that, communication. Yeah, that I'm, band. I'm, I'm, I, okay. Maybe it's forty gigahertz or beyond. Yeah. Yeah. I actually don't know. It's yeah. At some looking. point, when yeah. we get monetized enough, we'll hire a production assistant that can Google shit while we're talking. Yeah, it's some frequency band that you can shoot from space to Earth. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And then for intersatellite communication, um, that seems like a horse of a different color. So is it? You said it's an oscillator, so that implies that it's sending out like a clock signal at like correct the same amount. Correct. Very 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 accurate. Very precise. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Exactly like that. <laughs> yeah. It's my CDMA impression. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's doing CDMA, but I'm just being like, again. Uh, it, it's actually like uh, lesser advanced technology than that. Cool. Yeah. So it's just pulsing at the same frequency. Exactly. So it's, That's it. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Cool. For people listening, I've been moving my hand in and out like an octopus. In an ejaculatory movement from, <laughs> yeah. from your forehead. <laughs> I didn't even think of it that way, but yeah, that's hilarious. I can see why you've been giggling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah my forehead is, uh, is ejaculating. Yeah. But, uh, okay, so you, I think you told me a little bit about this earlier. So you've got an oven oscillator inside of another oven that you've built around it with a vacuum inside. And and that's what gives you your clock signal. Uh, it, for the most part, yeah. And we can't take credit for any of the ovenization. The only thing we did was the logic around maintaining a very high precision frequency signal. I mean, all the, all part the, of that comes from the ovenization, doesn't it? But that was done by another team. That got it. That okay. was not us. Yeah, got yeah. It. I see. So what was what was your role in building that? just the logic so at assuming that we have the ovenized clock that is um that maintains precision over temperature which is a difficult thing to achieve um yeah. then we add software firmware logic on top of that to add to the accuracy of the existing ovenized signal you make it more accurate than it is correct 
Wait, how do you do that? So, um, if, if you think of any physical system, so like, uh, Chris Law said, there's a, uh, like, it's, it's following the laws of physics. You, this material with this, um, amount of purity and the purity varies across manufacturing samples. So like you manufacture a million units, you're going to have slightly different variants across your, but I'm guessing you got a good one cause you send it to space. What, so the, the, the passive characteristics of each of the individual things varies all by themselves. But in, you're right, like the ones that will go to space have a very tight tolerance. So um, they will oscillate at a specific frequency, plus or minus some like very small tolerance. Okay. Right. But they still have a tolerance. And that tolerance is... What's your band approximately? Um, so they measure in parts per billion or parts per million parts per trillion. Wait, is that like in terms of a percentage? Correct. So like, wow. Okay. So like you take, take, take a number and however many, I, I'm, I would try to describe the math, but I've, I've had three of your Japanese whiskeys, so I'm going to sound Yeah, only had a few cocktails before that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's what, like whatever slurring that you hear is a result of that. Um, uh, so like if you Plus have half a, a bottle of this now. <laughs> so if you have a, uh, I, I don't even want to try to explain it, but like just billion, you move over six decimal places, and or million, you move over six billion, you move over nine nine. Yeah, trillion. So that's how, many, that's how many. That's how many. <laughs> that's how many decimal places are moving. Yeah, on the other side. Um. So I, I, and it's been a while. So I think the requirement was a hundred parts per billion. So, oh yeah, that's pretty wild. Yeah. So that that's how many decimal places are allowed changing at the end. So like, so take. So that's like the drift of the thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's pretty goddamn accurate. Yeah. So, so it take, like... take the natural variance of the natural quartz plus add the ovenization over temperature. Now on top of that, add uh, firmware logic that's gonna more finely tune the error further down the decimal places. That's what we were doing. Interesting. I mean, you're probably not allowed to tell me, but I'm kind of curious how you did that in terms of the firmware logic. Like, how do you, um, it's, it's, how do you make something more accurate than it is, Nick Anthony? Tell me. It, <laughs> the 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 significant thing is like okay. timing. Like, how 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 frequently do you need to sample the thing, right? So it's like interesting. So you can you can we because you're flowing in lower earth orbit you're below the gps satellites so you can get your you can get a gps signal that is um oh you can just sync to one of them yeah so you're you're getting a reliable signal from a atomic scale clock so you're getting a one pulse per second that's guaranteed one pulse per second like and you're just taking that off a better clock than you got on board correct the, nice. the yeah the one that we had on board was like cheap there's a gps uh, sync on the uh the master clock for this podcast studio oh yeah it's not hooked up. What what are you using it for? <laughs> uh, we don't need it. So we we want good relative time between the microphones and the different pieces of audio mm. equipment. So there's a bunch of high end pieces of digital studio yeah. equipment. Yeah. So imagine an imagine clock. thousands of your studios. There's flying. another oscillator in there. <laughs> <laughs> you have a thousand of these flying around Earth. Yeah. At any given time. And they're all snagging better clock signals off GPSs that yep. are in geosynchronous orbit or something like yep. that. I don't know if GPS is geosynchronous. Send all hate mail to podcast. That's gay. That's it is. It okay. is. Yeah. But the, so the, the cool thing was, um, we, we won that subcontract because the team that we were working with, like all put together a bill of materials that was based on automotive grade components because the, oh. the thought was, so like we're bending against, very like, interesting. we're bending against like Boeing and, Lockheed Martin and all these other companies who were like, yeah, if you're going to build something in space, you got to build fucking like radiation hardened. And, but our hypothesis was like, eh, but the military has been bidding out work to industry for the last 150 years and private industry is going to make stuff according to military specs and then change part numbers. And like, they're going to make 50 million of something and they're going to sell, you know, 10,000 of them to the DOD for some exorbitant markup and they're going to sell the exact same part just not tested to the full specs of the 
military spec and sell it to a consumer market for some lower markup. So the thought was like, all right, we can use automotive grade components because they're, they're, they're tested to a higher standard than consumer grade. And we believe that like these will pass for the most part in space. That's interesting. And 60% of the bill of materials passed. So um, the cost of the payloads that was going up was... Probably a tenth? Uh, uh, no, it wasn't that low. It was, it was like close to 50%. Okay. Somewhere that's, around there. That's pretty good. So that's yeah. a yeah, value engineering, I guess. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, automotive is interesting because I feel like, yes, there are really, really good parts you can get in automotive that will go in other industries and last a while. But I hesitate to use automotive grade components for certain things because I feel like just the number of cycles you get out of it before it breaks is a lot lower with automotive grade than like industrial grade, for instance. It depends on what you're looking at. Okay. Um, like semiconductor specific. Something like a relay is, is the specific example I've got in my head. Yeah, like a mechanical relay. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Um, the, you can get like a million cycles out of an industrial one. That's, or like an automotive might be like 10,000. So that that's probably true because I uh, a lot of the mechanical stuff is dependent upon materials and like like finishes, right? So like. Your, the quality of your product is only as good as the material you use and like the surface finish. Yeah, which which directly that directly impacts cost. Like you like you get what you pay for kind yep. of thing. Um, so in semiconductors, the the um, like one you got not Murphy's law. What's the other one? Moore's law. Moore's law. Yeah. So so you got Moore's law working for you. On, yep. on, on like that. That's the every first eighteen thing. months, the uh, number of transistors you can fit into a space doubles yeah. for people listening. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then you have improved manufacturing processes. So like encapsulation, um, environment, like hardening processes, that kind of thing. So um, semiconductors like. like if you look at the automotive market, the like there's not a whole lot of difference between what's in automotive and what's in industrial or like even even aerospace. Like there's for the most part, it's it's the the same parts are coming off the same assembly line. It's it's just these parts were all tested to 100% against some very rigorous spec. And these ones that go into the automotive or industrial or consumer market either weren't tested or weren't or were tested to less stringent standards. So yeah. it's like the same assembly line, the, the top ten percent go over to this market for yeah. a very high margin and, and the all rest the rest go to this market. Yeah. So it's like um, the manufacturing processes are over overall like significantly better. It's just the, the testing standard for for the most part. That makes a lot of sense. So it's like buying uh, metal without material traceability sheet. Yes. Okay. Which I've done plenty of times. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> yeah. That, make, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's, that's sweet. So how do you get into making stuff? Like what, like what age did you decide, like, I want to... Be an electrical engineer. I want to. I want to be a dude that makes shit. Like, when did that become interesting to you? The weird, sad thing is, is I I know I actually remember the specific point, and it wasn't anything groundbreaking or significant. It was literally, we had a we had a PlayStation One in my basement, and um, my cousins always came over for Christmas. Uh, Megan, Patrick, Brian, Megan and Patrick are twins. Brian was the younger one. I I don't remember what happened, but we, like we usually fought over video games, and some something <laughs> happened. Yeah, something happened where uh, a controller broke, and I, I don't know. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, no, it wasn't a it wasn't a cable. This was a mechanical problem. I, I figured you were both grabbing opposite sides of the molding, and somehow you managed to deform an injection molding by snagging it and tug of warring. 
No, but I did yeah. um, break my hand hitting my brother because <laughs> he wouldn't let me do a fatality on him in Mortal Kombat 2. Yeah. And I literally shattered... Fatality. <laughs> and I didn't know it was broken until like months later. Because like I did not say anything to parents or adults. Yeah, of course. You and want them to know. Then the hand heals all fucked up. <laughs> and mom's like what'd you do and months later you know they had to re-break my hand oh jesus uh, but that that was over a video game but so probably same how thing. did that work like what was the procedure like to re-break your fucking hand like they did, was it like in the movies where they're just like Bleh! that that is what he did uh, actually just like yeah did you get like an opiate or like how did they, oh, they put me under okay yeah but uh, he, he yeah he was Fucking use its hands to break Broke it again. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Um, but so the yeah so the exact like epiphany moment of when well, like it was I don't know I was like ten eleven twelve and we had a PlayStation one controller that wasn't work it was like the up button wasn't working anymore <laughs> or the left button I don't know what it was and I just like took it apart and I was like oh I found the the D pad <laughs> was like snapped off so I just like hot glued it back together and. It worked for like three more games. Victory. Yeah, and and, and Patrick was like, "Wow, you fix it. You should be an engineer." And I was like, "Yeah, you should be an engineer." <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, I should. That was that. That was my grand epiphany. Was that's awesome. <laughs> I feel like it's similar for a lot of us. Like, yeah. yeah. For me, it was like I, I started messing around with electrical stuff when I was like seven years old in my parents' basement. I had. A bunch of Woolwork power supplies that I had cut the barrel jack connectors off of and put alligator clips on from Radio Shack. And I had this IKEA bench and I wrapped like a bunch of the metal stuff with electrical tape and then I clipped the alligator clips with electrical tape and I had like 5 <laughs> volts, 12 <laughs> volts, 24 volts. And I, I would just buy like random shit from Radio Shack and hook up these simple circuits and I started doing that, and then and I was like, "Oh yeah, I'm, I'm a genius. I can." That seems way more intelligent than what I was doing. I was like randomly plug it. Like we'd find a TV in the back alleyway, and then we'd open it up and like jump her. But like we had no idea what the fuck we were. Like we yeah. could have died. Well, I mean, we <laughs> we would definitely take the flash capacitors out of CRT. Maybe not the flash, but the uh, whatever big ass capacitors like yeah. power the. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like the stuff in the CRT monitor where you're just like, and there's like a big spark. And yeah. It's, amazing against a metal plate and you know you think it's amazing as a kid like we would do that kind of stuff we would take the flash capacitors out of um disposable cameras and shock each other with them <laughs> like chase me and one friend had a competition when we were kids to like uh take a radio shack project enclosure and i took two bolts on mine and i took the flash capacitor and then i had the flash from the camera and i hot glued it inside of the project enclosure and then i had two buttons and one Actually, no, I think I had three buttons. So I had a charge button, and then I had a flash button, and then I had, like, a discharge button. And the discharge button would just hook up the two bolts, like, to the capacitor so you could, like, hit someone with it and shock them. And then the flash button would discharge it into the flash, and then the charge button would charge it off the batteries, which I think was, like, either an That's way more thoughtful than, like, a... <laughs> yeah. what? I was just shoving shit. Down. I was always over-engineering yeah. stuff, like... <laughs> I think my friend's was like a bigger project enclosure and he just had charge and like then it would just shock you if you touched it to me. And then we just chased each other around with these things. And we we had this rivalry. Um, his dad was an audio engineer for like uh, Biggie Smalls and Smashing Pumpkins. So oh, he, shit. he taught us how to do a lot of this stuff. Yeah. And then we just had this rivalry. Was this in Pittsburgh? This was in Pittsburgh. Oh, yeah. shit. Yeah. I went to that That's Winchester Thurston cool. school, and it was like one of the other parents and kids there, and taught me all the stuff. Yeah. Did you ever meet Biggie Smalls? I never met Biggie Smalls. I think he was dead before I like was. I must have been like like nine, seven years old when he croaked. Like I, I was not. How old are you? I, I'm thirty four. How old are you? Thirty eight. All right, so we're close enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think I was. I remember I was sixth grade when Tupac died, and you you knew they, about Tupac when you were in sixth grade. Yeah, you had better musical taste than me at that age. Well, I wasn't into Tupac at that time. Yeah. I just remember the I, I remember 
Because that was 96. I thought it was 97. 96, 97. So, yeah, yeah I was 96. I only 97. know because I got into Tupac later when I developed good taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, nah, he I mean he was like twenty four when he croaked. He was young to shit. Yeah, he was he was very yeah. young, it was unfortunate. But uh yeah. Now the nineties was a wild time. I mean, I definitely enjoyed learning about engineering then. Um we went to Goodwill computers, we would collect uh different computers from different eras. Different eras, like the eighties and the nineties. So like um I remember you get a Mac Plus for five dollars, and then it was like half off on Sundays, so it was two dollars and fifty cents. So I just bought all these old computers with like my allowance money, and then I had this museum of computers. That is so cool. Do you still have it? No, no. I, I, my parents threw that stuff all out, but I had it for a little bit. Fucking parents, right? <laughs> Goddamn adults. <laughs> yeah. I I still give my mom shit to this day. She sold my original Nintendo. At a garage sale for twenty bucks. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's rough. Yeah, I never had the original Nintendo. I had the Super NES. I I, like I I will give my parents credit. Like, so this was eighty nine, maybe. I was born eighty four, so uh, I, I was born eighty eight. Four years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Four years later after. The math works yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. 38, 34. It's how Can it add four? <laughs> <laughs> but, like, looking back, I guess uh, they weren't, like, bombastic news stories back then, but I can imagine, like, my parent, my parent, like, I got a Nintendo game system at, like, the age of five or six in 89, 90, right? Like, I have to believe there was plenty of propaganda of like, don't do this for kids. <laughs> like, and I remember, I distinctly remember um, when I was older, maybe I was in middle school, this was Super Nintendo was out. And Mortal Yeah, I had that in elementary school because I was younger than you. But. Yeah, and I yeah. think Mortal Kombat 3 was just coming out. And this was right around the time where, like, violent video games were, like, the, the pinnacle of news Yeah, stories. like the devil. Yeah. And Mortal Kombat was the, the pinnacle of violent video yeah, games at the time. at the time. Which Before Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, and now it pales in comparison to what, you know... People have come up with. Yeah, yeah. it's like, all right, you're going to rip a person's head off and they're going to bleed. <laughs> like, whatever and yeah. it's pixels yeah it's it's pix heavily pixelated so Mortal Kombat 3 was the the new game coming out and I distinctly remember I I remember being like young and having this exact thought my grandma was checking out at Toys R Us and I wasn't there I only remember she was either retelling the story or whatever I can't remember how I heard this but it was I heard a second hand telling of the story and I remember my grandma's checking out at Toys R Us. Now, mind you, like, Toys R Us is a kid's store, and they're carrying Mortal Kombat 3. Yeah. And my grandma, in her sixth, like, she's an elderly woman checking out of a Toys R Us with Mortal Kombat 3. She got picketed. Well, the cashier, like, speaks up and is like, hey, um, you know, or, who is this for? And she's like, it's for my grandson. And she's like, how old's your grandson? And she's like, However, what it was at the time, I don't know, like ten, yeah. yeah, whatever, insert number. <laughs> she's, and uh, she's like, whatever, he's ten. And she goes, this game's, this game is recommended for like sixteen. Episodes. This is very like dangerous. She's like, whatever, it's what he wants. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, Blow me, coos. Cha -ching. <laughs> like, like, and I remember, I remember thinking like, whatever age I was at the time, ten. I remember thinking like, damn, that was gangsterish. Fuck. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Did like, you be your grandmother was, was Tupac? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, that was gangster grandma checking out at Toys R Us, like, and the clerk bitch, is giving you bitch, shit. Bitch, cash yeah. me out! Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, my money's no good here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. All right, so you fixed a D pad. What were some of the other things you worked on, like around that age, that you were able to build? Mm. 
Most of it was. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's always stupid shit at that it's age. The, yeah, I mean, like we we found a TV that somebody threw out. We we just like we didn't do anything to it. We took it apart, plugged a bunch of shit. Like that that was the one where we should have died. Like we're plugging shit <laughs> into a TV. Like we had, and we're plugging it into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> But you had it plugged into the wall and you were like, Yeah, we're like, oh, we're going to unscramble all of the TV channels by. (laughs) (laughs) Speed of scrambling. My parents had this idea that, like, it would be. uh, So this was like early internet addiction. This would have been the early 2000s, like 2002, 2003. And um, they cut off our internet at a certain time they were like yeah these kids can't have internet and then at the night they'll be looking at porn or whatever and so like we me and my brother got like a another modem on ebay or something that was like the same modem they had and we configured it to be a clone and then we um got these boxes that were like ethernet switches it was like an ab switch and I don't know why we thought this would work, but we thought, like, if we just scramble the channels up and then we have another box that recombines them opposite to the way they were scrambled, then we can be the only ones that have working internet if we use these encoders and decoders. And did it work? I don't think it did. I mean, <laughs> it might have, but I kind of doubt it. Like, that's not how Ethernet works, I don't think. Um <laughs> So you were, your, your goal was to scramble everybody else's internet but keep yours? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought if we had like one working modem and we scrambled it and then we de-scrambled ours, it would, it would somehow work. <laughs> we didn't understand that stuff. You know, we were just trying. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't so you kind of encrypted it. It was so, to block everybody else. <laughs> Well, it was so our parents wouldn't catch us. <laughs> it was... And then we had another idea, which was great. So we had these built-in shelves in our rooms that were like... So this was like if the scrambler didn't work. We had this other idea that was like the built-in shelves in the rooms had these little pegs. And then you would put the shelves on those pegs. So the idea was like you would have pegs that you soldered uh, the ends of an Ethernet cable to. And you could just plug them in to holes that were plugged into a working internet connection. And I think we ran, like, Cat5 up to these things in order to set this up. Did it work? Um, I think that one that one would have worked if we hadn't gotten caught. So that one... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one we got caught by the electrician that was that was in our parents' house. And they took out all of our cabling. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that would have worked. <laughs> That's clever. Like, yeah, yeah, I I never thought of anything remotely that like I didn't. I don't think I got clever until I got. I actually had a degree. Like, like I, I had a clever moment in seventh grade or sixth grade, where like I I wrote a graphing calculator program for the T eighty three plus that could come up with seating charts, and so it would. Always, How did you come up with that? I, I spent a lot of time. Uh, I mean, I, I it was in sixth grade. I had nothing but time, and so I wrote like vector graphics to draw like a schematic of the classroom how did you know to draw vector graphics i mean i just dicked around with it like instead i i had so much fucking time on my hands like i I just kept playing with it and it was it was all basic and and you would program with your thumbs on the graphing calculator and that was the first programming language i learned was ti basic and um you could have it draw like a square or like a line or like text. And so, you know, you would get the coordinates down for squares and you'd be like, well, that looks like our classroom. These squares all represent the desks in the classroom, the way they're configured. And then, you know, we had a random number generator. And then I think the way we saw if it was, cause you wanted different numbers for each desk and you had random numbers for each person. So you would, Look, this was a stupid algorithm. Like I, this, this is not what I'm advocating for. But this is what I did in sixth grade. Y- you would see if a number had been assigned already. So you would look for like a random number from one to thirty. I don't remember what kids were in the class, but like say thirty or twenty, and and you would be like, okay, was nineteen assigned yet? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, no. Okay, this one's nineteen. Okay, was eighteen assigned? Yes, no, yes, no. Yes. Okay, this one's eighteen. Okay, seventeen assigned? Yes, yes. Okay, this one's seventeen. And then you would just give numbers to every desk in the classroom that way, and. 
you know, it obviously got slower as you went through because you only have one number left at the end. Uh, but that's how we did it. And then it would always leave one table clear. And then I traded my teacher for giving her this program, the ability to sit with my best friend at that table all the time. So I would always sit with my best friend and then everyone else got assigned seats by that program. And so yeah, it was, it was a good deal for a sixth grader. So the teacher used it as an assigned seating tool. Yeah, she didn't have to think because it just did it for her. Did she know that it was working in your favor? Well, she must have because, I mean, I wasn't smart enough to figure out because there were just numbers it was giving her. And so I say it always sat me next to my best friend, but really there was just a table it didn't assign seats to and that was our table. And so we always got the extra table gotcha. in exchange for the deal I worked out with my teacher. Gotcha, which gotcha. Is, I'll give you this program in exchange for the ability to always sit next to my best friend at the time. Interesting. And then we had another program, and, and this was the late 90s, I think, at the time, which would, um, it was an instant messenger, but it worked through the graphing calculator, like link cable. And so because we were sitting next to each other, we could just hook up the cable between our two calculators and nobody knew about instant messaging because this was the 90s. And so sure. um, it was a shitty program. It had no buffer, but like you would send a message to the other person and they would check to see if they sent you a message back. So if you sent three messages, two of them would get lost and they would yeah, get the yeah. latest one. When but they you're how you. old? Uh, I would have been like 12, 13 years old. Yeah, yeah, I was doing anything close to that. Yeah, well. Like, that, that's gangster shit. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you were doing gangster shit. I was, I was, uh, so, <clears throat> 12 years old, I was making the <clears throat> gateway computer in the classroom say cuss words on the dictionary software. That's pretty funny, too, though. <laughs> <laughs> It was saying fucking balls and that that, <laughs> balls, that, that balls. was that was when I got my like first like string of detentions in school was from Dude, I always was in the record for the most amount of trouble in school. I went to Catholic school. I went to private school and then public <laughs> school. But, uh, no, I always was getting in more trouble than everyone else. It was fun. Like, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I take pride in that. From, like, kindergarten to grad school, being in the most amount of trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, there's never been a time in my life when I wasn't in the most amount of trouble. Maybe as a professional. Like, I'm now not in as much trouble because I've figured out a system for which this to work for me. Which it sounds like you have, too. I mean, you know, like... Contract engineering is a great way to not be getting in trouble because, you know, you're running the show and therefore you're not likely to get disciplined and you want to do right by your client because, you know, you, your whole success is measured by their success. And so I, th I think that's a construct by which troublemakers do well. I, I think you're right because there's no, <laughs> there's no, um. I guess I guess there's <clears throat> plenty of arbitrary points, but there's no. I think it's the closest to objective outcomes you can get. Yeah. Well, and also I I feel like for me at least, like I tend to get into trouble when I'm bored. So if I'm understimulated mentally, that's when I start, you know, fucking shit up, as it were. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Correct. Yeah. But, you know, if I'm solving the most difficult engineering problems in the world, I mean, it sounds like you do as well, that's when, you know, it's like, it's very difficult to get into trouble because you don't have time. And also, like, you're stimulated. You know, you're not, you're not looking for trouble because you've already got stimulation. But your trouble is if something goes wrong, like, shit's really wrong. Yeah, but you're, like you're going to fix high. it because yeah. you're a troublemaker. Like, you're, you're a problem solver. You're a person that wants to you know figure out something that nobody else could think of right like i, I and I, I i think i think your um a observation of what a troublemaker is is accurate is like you want the stakes to be high 
So it's like if you're if you're not challenged in any way, shape, or form, like you're gonna up the stakes however you can. So like you're gonna you're gonna create a scene where one doesn't need to exist. <laughs> but if if the environment is there where the stakes are already high, then like you don't need to go. You don't you don't need yeah, to. Go you're not looking something. for trouble because yeah. it's there already. Yeah, the stakes just, are high, so like you have to. You're solving the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's the case for me as well, and. I mean, it's. I said it to my dad the other day. I'm like, the only time I ever get into trouble is when I'm not stimulated, you know. And, and when when life is good and I've got you know interesting contracts and I'm you know working on you know bleeding edge robotics. I mean, I don't have any interest to get into trouble because I'm just having fun and and fixing other people's problems. And yeah, but like my brain is going. You're probably bored with simple problems. Sure. Yeah, I yeah, agree. Like you need high stakes. I'd never be able to function outside of R and D. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a fact. Yeah, you need you need to work on a project that like one of my first bosses fail. said that to me. He's like, you would never function outside of R and D. Yeah, and I'm like, you know what, Matt? You're right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, like solving solving like a just a little bit. That's good. Thank you. Um, like. Solving a problem that's been solved a million times before is not, not entertaining. Yeah, it's not compelling. It's Nor like, is figuring out the long tail of a problem that's been solved. You know, like, how do we get X edge case that only shows up every, you know, 100 trials or so? I don't know, like... Even like I, actually, I, that I, could be interesting. I could find that interesting yeah, because yeah, yeah no, no, no. You, yeah, I, that was yeah, a bad example. Yeah, bad example. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> Because that's that's actually a really fun elusive problem. Yeah, it's I like just if you do, if you see it, like you're, that's a an opportunity to observe. Yeah, like you're, you're, all the instrumentation goes on, and, yeah. and you're you're trying to track the motherfucker down. Yeah, no, like dif- difficult problems are are the most stimulating. It's like I would not be satisfied if we had regular work that like was lucrative and but it, we're solving the same problem over and over and over and over yeah well a lot of people make their whole careers doing that though is the thing that's interesting to me yeah but i mean that that's how you make money is repeatability right so it's yeah like finding, maybe though you i mean, mean you, you and mean, i earn pretty good money though is the thing you know it's uh, i mean like feast of famine <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's either it's either like we're doing really good throughout the year or we're not yeah um, or you have a really good three months yeah then. unless you're like super diversified across a bunch of different like which yeah. we've gotten better at but yeah for sure still it's like like we have a manufacturing business but like we're we're i'm breaking that off into its own like separate entity for somebody else to run because like that is not like we do very good at taking something from zero to one like here's a concept that doesn't currently exist and it's zero so bring it Peter Thiel's book, Zero to One. The manufacturing entity takes one and scales it up to N. So that's a different problem to solve than bringing it into existence. Yeah, I agree. Well, I'm I'm interested in that as well. So yeah, like it, it's 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 what you do as well, yeah. right? Like yeah, we've got this in common. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I mean. I don't know what it is like about R and D that just kind of keeps me stimulated, but I mean it's it's definitely fun. You're always learning, um, you're always solving interesting problems. Somebody's always depending on you. Like they're losing their shit and they don't know how to do it, and you're their only hope. Like Star Wars, right? Like help me, Luke Skywalker, my <laughs> only hope. <laughs> it, yeah, there's a like that. Uh, it seems to be the story of of the life of an early stage you know, uh, new product development professional. Yeah, and it... Uh, in my head, I'm reconciling the, the Luke Skywalker analogy. Got it. Yeah, because I'm not a Star Wars expert, but my fiance is, so I'm, I, I want to make sure she's I'm... She's cool. I like her a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's the best. Yeah. I want to I make sure I'm doing her justice by 
either acknowledging your Skywalker reference or rebutting it where it should be rebutted. But I, I already yeah, know. Yeah, Demi, Demi, if you got me. <laughs> I don't even have no get, idea. Get him, get him. Yeah. <laughs> we'll follow up via email if I missed something. Yeah. Nick, it's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, I think it's time to cut. Is there anything you want to plug while you're still here? Just Pymeos, IoT product development, wireless, hardware, firmware, custom circuit board development. Nice. Check out Pymeos, uh, all the stuff Nick just said. And uh, if you're in the market for complex robotic systems at the early stage of new product development, check out SKA, Custom Robots and Machines. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, please subscribe to Collab Group with Spencer Krauss on YouTube. Uh, because if you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Thanks again, and see you on the next one.